Welcome back. March 15th, 2021. There are two reasons there have been no Republican or pro-Republican or pro-conservative or pro-MAGA riots or violence in Washington, D.C. since January 6th. One, Democrats who run Washington, D.C., from the mayor's office and city council to the capital structures and operations, have created a garrison military state of control there. Second, it's not anything like a normal or standard process for conservatives or pro Republican activists to violently riot. There is no conservative version of Antifa or BLM. There is no record of mass municipal violence or rioting on behalf of Donald Trump or the MAGA or GOP movements. It is simply an outrage that what happened January 6th happened, and it's an outrage that the Democrats have used it to create an imagery of an imaginatory, credible threat to our democracy from the right. Eight thousandths of one percent of Trump supporters were engaged in one day of that January 6th event. Eight thousandths of one percent. And none of them were recognized by any serious level of Republican or conservative. None of them were names we knew. None of them were people we knew. None of them spoke on behalf of our party or movement. None of them ever published anything. None of them helped cobble together anything like a coherent philosophy as for one example, the most well-publicized of the writers was until this year an environmental nut carrying signs that said such things as, quote, the poles are shifting, the ice caps are melting, this is Ragnarok, it's time to wake up, close quote. On the other hand, you have Antifa and BLM riots being denied, not denounced, denied, endowed, supported, rationalized and excused by major corporations, major liberal and democratic outlets from CNN and MSNBC guests and anchors to the president and vice president of the United States to the speaker of the House of Representatives. Such riots have led to the deaths of dozens. Such property damage is in the billions of dollars. Yet to this day, razor wire and National Guard troops have been used to weaponize not only Washington, D.C., but Washington, D.C. politics. The National Guard wanted to leave D.C. The Secretary of Defense overruled the head of the National Guard. The Capitol Police themselves are claiming there's no credible threat justifying the ongoing military presence in D.C. This is all the Dream Palace stuff of the Democrats, somewhat akin to Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who wasn't at any time under physical assault on January 6th, saying Ted Cruz tried to kill her. Meanwhile, riots in Portland have resumed. Because why? Why were they rioting last summer? Trump? William Barr? Well, then why now? Local reports state Portland has been the site of frequent protests, many involving violent clashes between officers and demonstrators ever since the police killing of George Floyd in Minneapolis in May. Over the summer, there were demonstrations for more than 100 straight days. The fencing had been installed in June in Portland to help de-escalate tensions between city police and protesters following Floyd's death, according to Fox 12 Oregon, but reportedly turned into a point of contention. Stay with me. Police said at the time that they recognized the fence had become a, quote, symbol of divide between the department and the community, and that they would remove the fence to show, quote, our willingness to have a dialogue and peaceful communication towards starting the healing of our community. We are open and listening to discussions of how the community envisions its police and serve them in the future, the department said in a series of tweets. Quote, our hope is that the nightly violence and destruction around the Justice Center will stop and the focus can be directed towards peaceful conversation, close quote. Local and federal officials held conversations over several months to determine the best time to take down the fence. Department of Homeland Security told Fox 12 on Friday that the decision to remove the fencing on Wednesday was, quote, made in collaboration with local leaders from Portland 
as part of a broader effort to help return the city to normalcy, close quote. So the government is negotiating with the rioters. However, just one day after the fencing was removed, rioters marched down the streets of Portland, setting fires and smashing windows. They weren't talking to the white rioters, perhaps. Now, if I may, did anyone say the fencing and wire and troops in D.C. were points of contention? Or because Nancy wanted it, Nancy just got it, and conservatives just kind of had to shrug and put up with it. There were no negotiations, certainly, between Republicans and Democrats on getting rid of the National Guard. Republicans have had nothing to say about it, but it gets better. Back to local reporting out of Portland. Thursday's violence in Portland was expected with some business owners boarding up their businesses earlier in the day, OregonLive.com reported. At about 9.15 p.m. at Northwest 15th Avenue and Northwest Overton Street, some in the crowd began breaking windows and officers moved in to address the criminal behavior, creating a perimeter around the group on Northwest Marshall Street. Now, what's the most important sense sentence in all of the above. It's the same thing people forget, but was absolutely true. You can still Google it. Businesses all across America in major cities boarded up and closed on November 3rd of last year out of fear of violent rioting. Violent rioting expected from the left if Biden did not win. Violence from the left was expected last year and again in Portland last week. I repeat, Thursday's violence in Portland was expected, with some business owners boarding up their businesses earlier in the day, as Oregon Live reported. It's a neat trick the left has played here, because we all just kind of expect left-wing violence, but we do so as if it's just common cause and part of the air we breathe and what's to be expected, whereas the Democrats are now trying to make the 1 January 6th event, the Reichstag, for all denunciation and censorship of conservatives. Meanwhile, and in some fashion ironically, we who expect the left to be violent and have known of their propensities for violence for years, decades, even as they win cultural victory after cultural victory, we have actually never tried to silence them, never tried to censor them. This notion of the council culture working both sides of the street or that conservatives also try to silence liberals, show me where. Few of us did not agree with the ACLU that Nazis had to write, had the right to march in the 1970s. A few of us do not think the lunatics who have part of the Westboro Baptist Church have the right to protest U.S. soldier funerals. But that, that ain't conservatives trying to ban liberals or leftists. That's conservatives trying to ban Nazis and lunatics trying to ruin family and military burials. Meanwhile, the left tells us Pepe Le Pew and Dr. Seuss are threats to our children and their emotional and gender and racial growth. But that same left, hosting the Grammys last night on network television, was happy, delighted, celebratory of an X-rated show starring Cardi B writhing in stripper's clothing with a stripper's pole to a song whose name I'm not even allowed to state on air, descriptive of the most literally obscene phraseology and noun one could conjure up. This would be the same Cardi B who, though he rationed interviews like a desert dweller rations water, Joe Biden sat down with to give a campaign interview with, because he thought it would gain succor in the black community for him. To say we tolerate and venerate pornography and censor and condemn Dr. Seuss is the kind of thing a decade ago would have been translated into what some would justifiably consider the end of a culture, the death of a culture. One might add to it that this pornography is seemingly okay with CBS, which airs the Grammys, while Sharon Osbourne, saying she doesn't think a former CNN host named Piers Morgan is a racist because he doesn't like Meghan Markle, has caused CBS to melt down and suspend the show Sharon Osbourne is on. Same CBS. My favorite part of the Osbourne contratat is this. The show is called The Talk. 
Evidently, you just can't talk honestly at CBS or defend Piers Morgan when he criticizes Meghan Markle. My favorite part of the offending transcript from last week with Sharon Osbourne is this. She says to Cheryl Underwood, quote, educate me. Tell me when you heard Morgan say racist things. Educate me. Tell me, close quote. She was begging to understand what Piers Morgan said that was so racist or racist at all. Underwood responded to Osborne, quote, it's not the exact words of racism. It's the implication and the reaction to it. To not want to address that because she is a black woman and to try to dismiss it or to make it seem less than what it is, that's what makes it racist, close quote. So there it is. You cannot criticize a human being for doing something wrong or saying something stupid or lying if that human being is a member of a protected race, even if you make zero reference to that race. Morgan never said anything racist. It's that he criticized someone, and that person, that someone, happened to be of a protected racial class. Today, anyway. Who knows what race will be more preferred and protected tomorrow? That's the problem with this race crap. It's all so arbitrary, just as racial categorizations and classifications to us have always been arbitrary. But then again, and I can't stress this enough, it's not the right making racial categorizations. It's the liberals and the left. And it's not the right condemning Piers Morgan, a liberal, or Sharon Osbourne, a liberal, or suspending a show called The Talk. It's the left. Meanwhile, CBS will get no sanction for putting the red light district into your living rooms. You see, living rooms have now been made emotionally and intellectually safe because the week before, we made sure that Dr. Seuss doesn't stain them anymore. This is wholesale madness and retail frenzy. It is the Ides of March. I'll close with Shakespeare and Julius Caesar if I can still quote Shakespeare. Cowards die many times before their deaths. The valiant never taste of death but once. One wonders how much more valiance we have in this culture. You see, the fault is not in our stars anywhere. It's in ourselves. I'm Seth Liebson. We'll be right back. <laughs> 